I'm getting an extra solo over here. Thank you. How great thou art. Isn't that good? How great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art. How How great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. Matthew. Matthew's Gospel, chapter number 5. We continue in the Sermon on the Mount. Bogdanus family, thank you for hanging out. I know that you're going to make a trip tomorrow. We're going to uh, look this morning at just a few verses, Matthew 17 through 20, but I'd like to read the whole, uh, well, let's start at the beginning of the chapter and read all 20 verses this morning, but we're going to focus in on verses 17, 18, 19, and 20. Um, You say, well, at the rate you're going, Pastor, four verses a week, we should be here by 2022. I said, well, you know. No, we're going to cover lots of ground next week because we're setting it up. Next week's message lays down off of 17 through 20. Now, we hit a little bit of verse number 20 in an introduction a few weeks ago about righteousness because I really believe in the the Sermon on the Mount here that Jesus Christ is teaching true righteousness. The theme verse up on our artwork but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. We'll have that up here in a little bit. But we, again, as a church, uh, over, just think over the last two or three years, we've looked at Jesus and his church and the acts of the apostles. We looked at uh, Jesus Christ and his miracles and his parables. Uh, and we've seen also, too, his healings a little bit. So we really looked at a overall, hey, Jesus and his church, church corporately collectively god took us then to a place at the first of the year where really it was more of a personal study more of a one-on-one type of study nothing is beyond his grace off of our acts 1a conference last year experience grace and by the way our acts 1a conference is here in three weeks it's hard to believe uh, that we are here for our missions conference again uh, please be praying for brian and Alex Chippy and his wife Crystal Chippy and their two daughters as they will get on a plane middle of this week from Zambia and uh, pray that they uh, make it to their end spot, which is here. But as we got into nothing is beyond his grace uh, at the beginning of this year, we looked at a study in 2 Samuel and we looked at the reign of King David and his life with God and experiencing God's incredible grace, God's incredible mercy in his life. Well, as God has led us here, we're in another really, really personal type of study here. The Sermon on the Mount. Doctrinally, theologically, we can look at uh, its context and see that this is a kingdom of heaven uh, speaking to the Jews type of message. And you say, well, then uh, we shouldn't be in it, but all scripture is given by inspiration of God, and we know it's profitable for all of us. Doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. And God's already showing us a great deal of things. Last week we looked at salt and light and the fact that they may be the missing ingredients in our gospel message. It doesn't mean that the Lord Jesus Christ made them missing or that they're so hard to find. It's that we don't actually oftentimes live by the word of God, by the salt of the earth, and by the light of the world like we should be so that the gospel, when we speak it, has a little bit more traction to people. And then, of course, two weeks ago, we looked at the Beatitudes. We looked at blessed is he, excuse me, blessed are the poor in spirit. And so we're going to read that here in a little bit. And today I want you to kind of focus in on that verse in verse number 20 a little bit, but all four verses, they really point to righteousness. 
And so we're going to look at righteousness this morning in a, in a way that I believe God's leading in this passage of Scripture by the Spirit of God. And as I've, of course, prepared and studied all week long, uh, just believing that this is where God would have us to be. So let's look at verse number one. Follow along with me. I want to read all 20 verses, but we're going to really focus in on verses 17 through 20 this morning. And seeing the multitudes, Jesus, of course, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Verse number 10, blessed are they which are persecuted for what? For righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Pointing, of course, to the kingdom of heaven, the physical fulfillment of God's kingdom that he has promised. He has promised to the nation of Israel, his elect, one day. He's also promised those that are in the kingdom of God, that are born again, we're in the spiritual kingdom. When he fulfills all in the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll see that kingdom of heaven. So Jesus is speaking this Sermon on the Mount, his very first preaching message, after 400 years of darkness and not hearing from God, the Son of Man, the Son of God, appears. And he is the Messiah. He is the King of Kings. He is the Master Teacher. He is everything. Yet they don't even know that yet. They don't even understand that. And so he is speaking to disciples that are very close to him. But he's also speaking to the multitudes that are around him. For the most part, as far as we know, this is a Jewish audience. These are Hebrews of Hebrews. There are scribes here, and there are Pharisees. There are religious people that know the Word of God. They know the Old Covenant. They know the Old Commandments. They know the Law. And he's about to teach them something very, very strong in verses 17 through 20. So let's read verses uh, 11 down through 16 and complete our reading this morning. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you, persecute you, and shall say, All men are evil against you falsely. For my, name, for my sake, rejoice and be exceeding glad. For great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Verse number 13, ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost his savor. You like that personal pronoun? His savor. Wherewith shall it be salted? It is therefore good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. Ye are the light of the world, in verse 14. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works for what reason? To glorify your Father which is in heaven. Verse number 17, our text for this morning. Think not that I, Jesus Christ, I say unto you till heaven and past, excuse me. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy. Remember this statement, but to fulfill. Verse number 18, he speaks about fulfillment again. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven, but whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, Father, this is some strong words from Jesus, and we know his audience. But today, we're your audience, and we pray, and we ask you in the name of Jesus, 
our Father, God. We ask for the Spirit of God's working to do that which is more divine and more supernatural than just man speaking to man. My desire is for you to speak to every person here individually and personally, and that this is an individual one-on-one -on -one evaluation time before you, holy God, and where our righteousness, as we see ourselves, has been put. I pray that believers here understand the righteousness of God through the Lord Jesus Christ in a deeper way today, and I pray for those that do not know of what the righteousness of God really means through Jesus, that maybe they'll get a, no, more inkling, a better inkling this morning of what you're teaching. I pray, God, that you'll bless our time in your word. It is for you, in you, through you, that we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This is God's word. It's very, very powerful. You say, well, Sermon on the Mount. I mean, Jesus is preaching. Of course it's got to be powerful. I believe that when we cover these next few verses and, and then also look up a lot of other verses and have a little, little bit of a, a study and a little bit of a uh, chase around your Bibles, and, uh, that you'll see righteousness not just as the doctrine and theology that you know it is and how important it is to you, but it really is something that will put you in a place where you would say, my life is fulfilled in God's righteousness. And that is the catalyst and the kicker and, the, and the, the instigator for living a life that you know already is fulfilled in him. You see, today, when I think about and look up anything, like if you look up anything about fulfillment in life and, and, you, and you talk to people and say, well, I never thought that I'd get to a point where finally at 50, 60, 70 years old, I'm all retired and now I finally achieved fulfillment. I'm finally fulfilled in life. I've got, uh, been married for a few years, good children, got grandchildren, so many wonderful things that happen, and, and, and that's my fulfillment. Now, is that really fulfillment? You see, it's interesting to find out how we view fulfillment and how we attempt to attain fulfillment, and when we don't achieve it, when we don't attain it, attain it we're, we're just looking back at ourselves and going, what am I depending upon? Who am I depending upon for fulfillment in my life? Because Jesus Christ, right here, in just these few verses of the Sermon on the Mount, is getting these people to understand something. They're lost in their own righteousness, and they need the one who's speaking to him, them. They need his righteousness. And I wonder today, if many of you, of course, are born again, I, I know many of you, most of you in this room personally, and your testimony of receiving Christ as Savior, calling on the name of the Lord to save you, and understanding for maybe a moment, or then you went through a discipleship lesson, and you got the theology and the doctrine of having Jesus Christ's righteousness imputed upon your account. You say, oh, I'm righteous. And what happened? What have you forgotten about his righteousness when it comes to life's fulfillment? I wonder if we really have gotten to a place where we have chased so many things that attaining fulfillment has been absent from looking at the core piece of what righteousness in God through the Lord Jesus Christ can do for you and for me. Let me read you a couple of things that make me really concerned. Just over half of 18 to 35-year-old Christians surveyed for the next, excuse me, the connected generation. This is from Barna study. 18 to 35 Christians, 18 to 35-year-old Christians. In this study, 54% attend church at least once a month. This is an article dated November 13, 2019. It's not even a year old including one-third who are in the pews once a week or more. Three in ten attend less frequently. A small group of Christians says they used to go to church but no longer do. Despite their fairly consistent presence in the pews, almost half of the Christians, 44%, say that attending church is not an essential part of their faith. Practicing Christians, defining part of their regular attendance, are less likely to feel this way, though one-fifth in this group still agrees. Interesting that 
the view for church for young people, younger people than me, not so young, 18 to 35, is saying, yeah, 54% go once a month, once every four weeks. Oh, real quick, I'm just wondering something. If you showed up at your job once a month, how would that go? Well, that's relative, Brownie, because, you know, that's one day out of seven during the week. So that relative is, okay, so how, many, how, how would your job do if they, you showed up twice a week? You wouldn't have that job. What if you practiced the job that you have for the skills that you need once a month? How good would you be at your job? Probably not very good. If you studied once a month as a college student, how smart would you be? I tried it. It didn't go very well. I just want you to know. That might have been a good year once a month. It's bound for failure. September 3rd, 2020. Here's an article from Prophecy News Watch. The legendary Tom Abbey loves to send me little fun stuff. For those of you who know Tom. A great falling away. This is a 10-day-old article. 30% of evangelicals don't believe Jesus is God. Let me read for a moment here. As you see below, surveys have found that large numbers of evangelicals are abandoning core evangelical beliefs at a rate that is staggering. In fact, it has gotten to a point where I am not even sure the author of the article says what an evangelical Christian is anymore. So he says, I figured I'd look at the definition of evangelical Christian in 2020. And he goes down to read off of a website, National Association of Evangelicals. And it goes through, of course, they take the Bible seriously. They believe in Jesus Christ as the Savior and Lord. Good stuff? Good. The evangelical term from the Greek word, egulion, meaning the good news or the gospel. Thus, the evangelical faith focuses on the good news. But as he says here, that definition seems quite soft to me. What happened to the redemption, the justification, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of sins, repentance, faith? Help me here. So we wonder. With the wonderment of the falling away, is it going on? I was just telling Bobby and Dwayne recently, I don't know, maybe that part of it hasn't gone on yet. I guess it's going on. More than half of the American adults, including 30% of evangelicals, say Jesus isn't God. But most agree he was a great teacher, according to results from the 2020 State of Theology survey. Are you kidding me? This is where we're living. You and I are getting way too distracted off of the wrong subject matter. The souls of men that are lost and going to hell, or the ones that go to church and call them evangelicals, they don't even believe in Jesus Christ as Savior, Lord, King of Kings. Now think of Jesus' audience in the Sermon on the Mount. Are we here now together? Well, you know, that's back then, and this is now, and I, you better hang on here. Well, dispensationally for the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, and all that stuff, I mean, I don't know, preacher. I, I, listen here. Jesus Christ is preaching, as I said earlier, to a bunch of people who think they can earn their way into God's righteousness. You can't do it. And so what is Jesus Christ doing? He's clearly letting them know the law came, and I didn't come to destroy it. The prophets came, and they were important. I didn't come to destroy them either. I came to fulfill all righteousness I am the one who's come, and I'm coming for righteousness' sake as much as I'm coming for all the other things that I'm coming for. What do we got? Matthew 5, verse number 20. We just read it. For I say unto you, it's up on the screen, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. You know what kind of righteousness that is? The righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees is the man-learned righteousness. You know what a scribe was and a Pharisee in a situation like this? Just think about a scribe. They were the Bible teacher, interpreter, the writer. They were the ones that everybody came to when there was a question, one of those tough questions. Now, it's good to have a religious teacher around. It's good to have those people that are clerics and secretaries and recorders and writers. 
They're the ones that examine the more difficult and subtle questions of the law. They're, again, interpreters and teachers, and they're great to have. But they did all that they did to seek man's approval. A scribe was around to seek the approval of others and to become self-righteous. You may know of some people like that today. Again, there's nothing wrong with a scribe, someone who knows the Bible, but if it's only for knowledge and for self-righteousness, then it's against what Jesus Christ is showing them that they need to know about his righteousness. In fact, he's using their own self-righteousness of themselves, thinking they are learned and they're able to get God's righteousness against them. What is God trying to say? The Lord Jesus Christ, as God is saying, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Whose righteousness? Whose righteousness? It's his righteousness. Now, his righteousness is that doctrinal part that you love. His righteousness, when you look it up in your concordance, you go, oh my goodness, the righteousness of God. In a broad sense, the state of him who is ought to be. Righteousness, the condition acceptable to God. The doctrine concerning the way in which man may attain a state approved of God. This doctrine is concerning what? The way in which man may attain approval of God. How can that possibly be? When all the law cannot be fulfilled, it's from the old covenant. And now, check out the new covenant laws. Look them up. The lists are upon lists upon lists. Now, when you count them all up and you look at all the commands, if any of you have ever grabbed a Dake's Bible, it's got them all listed in the back. They got them all listed. You got over a thousand. But some of them can be summarized into another category, so there's only about 800 ish, which then is said that there's over 300 commands that are given. And Jesus Christ is saying, guess what? Those commands you ought to follow, but there's no way you can follow them unless you have my righteousness. You need to start with this righteousness. God's righteousness is this. It becomes a sinner's possession through that faith by which he embraces the grace of God that's offered to him in Jesus Christ. Let me say that again. It becomes a sinner's possession, the righteousness of God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And then it's imputed, so it's Jesus's. But it comes through faith with repentance by which they embrace, and you and I embrace the grace of God. God's grace saved you, for by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves as a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If you could earn your way into heaven, you couldn't earn your way into heaven. That's what Jesus Christ is saying in the Sermon on the Mount, these four verses. If you really could do it, you couldn't do it. I bet you know some people like that. I was one of those for an awful long time. So let me just kind of frame this for you a little bit here. Because I wonder, again, about the way we see fulfillment in life. Is it really attainable until there's a certain time in life? Or are we really looking at something that can be very practical in our lives and the theology and doctrine of the idea of righteousness and to be righteous is really, really, really great, but there's more to it. But seek ye first, but seek ye first, How many of you memorized that verse in your lives? Would you raise your hand? But seek ye first the kingdom of God. But seek ye what? Somehow that word got thrown out. You see, this morning for the next few minutes, I hope, I pray, I'm praying as I'm preaching that you will really see the righteousness of God through the righteousness of Jesus Christ can really truly be a place that you will attain complete fulfillment every day. No matter what's going on. You say, I've heard that kind of message before. I believe that we have theologically boxed things, pocketed things, put things away under the guise of some discipleship handbook and not live the gospel message of the discipleship of the Lord every single day, especially when it comes to having a fulfilled life. To attain fulfillment You're righteous in the Lord. Is this description of the believer in Jesus Christ enough to be fulfilled in life? I want so much more. 
I was told if I wanted to be anything I wanted to be in the world, I could just put my mind to it and I could be anything I wanted to be in the world and then I will have complete fulfillment. Nice try. For any of you kind of around my age, is that true? If you put your mind to it, you can be anything you wanted to be. I wanted to be a good pitcher. I stunk. I put my mind to it. If I look at the righteousness of God that's been imputed in me and upon me by the Lord Jesus Christ, then I realize in my own personal walk with the Lord, I can be anything that he wants me to be in his righteous will for my life. Why would I not want what he wants for me? Since he wanted so much for me that he gave his son. Is righteous the right enough adjective for your life to be fulfilled this morning? I believe it ought to be. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. The Bible teaches us, and through the Strong's Concordance, in a wide sense the word righteous means upright, virtuous, keeping the commands. Use of him whose way of thinking, feeling, and acting is wholly conformed to the will of God. Okay, that's good. Well, what's next in this part here? Let's look at this. We add N-E-S to the end of it. And now instead of it being an adjective, it's now a noun. When you add N-E-S to the adjective, it does. It's, that's what it is. And so it means the state or condition or quality. You have righteousness in God through the Lord Jesus Christ. I know that, Pastor. I've been taught that. I've heard you say it. So why is fulfillment in his kingdom so unattainable for many believers? You say, who are you to play God and tell that to me? My heartbroken hours of spending in prayer in counsel, in meetings, in mentoring, in discipling, and teaching others. In my own personal life, thinking, I need so much more. When he has said, I have given you all you need. And in the moment of the salvation that you claim by faith, my grace poured into you a new life in Christ. Old things passed away. Behold, all things became new. I know that. I got that. What became new? I don't feel new. Stop playing feelings. Feelings are okay. But I promise you one thing. When you get into the word and the truth of the word of God and you listen to what he has to say about righteousness, you're going to go, wow, his righteousness is my righteousness. I promise myself to realize and learn from you, holy God, that living in your kingdom is such a perfect way to go. To leave, live a life that's completely fulfilled and attainable is completely true, no matter what goes on around here. Because it's going to blow up, I promise you that. It's going to get messy, I promise you that. You may lose someone on the face of the earth that you never expected to lose. But I promise you one thing, that the righteousness of God, the holiness of God, the goodness of God, what we sang about, how great is, I, uh, how great is my God, is truly bound up and in, entangled and deeply wound into what he did for you and me when he gave you righteousness and made you clean. We have not been teaching it enough. You are a son of God. You are free not to live for yourself, but for him. And he deserves that. Let's go. Stop looking around the room at everybody else. It's on me. It's on me and it's on you because this is a self-reflective thing to understand that your fulfillment in this earth, fulfillment in this life, before you get to the kingdom of God, and I mean the kingdom of heaven one day in the millennial reign, is that you live in the kingdom of God right now. It's attainable all the time. All the time. You can be fulfilled all day long while your life is an absolute mess and you lose maybe some person 
precious to you or, or something bad happens or sickness takes over you or you got things or you got to take care of things in the hospital or you have people that are broken, broken around you or, or people are criticizing you or being mean to you or nasty to you. Or it doesn't stop. Yeah. Stop because I just want you to know that your fulfillment in this life is found in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Period. So I want you to see just two simple things. Well, you've been running your mouth for a while. Let's get to it. Okay, here we go. Up on the screen, Matthew 17 and 18, show me one thing. They show us all a lot, but they show us something here. So let me read it again with you. Verse number 17 says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. Okay. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass one jot, one tittle. Everybody know what jot is? Jot is the tiniest little letter, the last letter, the little tittle thing. That's a mark that ties together in the Hebrew construction of the letters that adds to make the construction of the letter. So it would be like an E. Has that little thing in the middle? That would be like a tittle. Okay? Jot, tittle. Every last letter. Every last little indistinguishable but distinguishable mark that God put in his word. The equivalent to this expiration would be like, I got to dot the I or I got to cross the T. That's the way the tittle works. So he says, till heaven and earth pass, one jot, one tittle, shall in no wise pass from the law till all the fulfillment. Everything. Listen, okay, so I got that. Fulfilled, fulfilled, fulfilled. He's going to fulfill everything, right? Okay. So let me ask you, what about your fulfillment? So just hang with this for about five, ten minutes here. Here we go. Watch this. Two things. Attainable fulfillment. Our righteousness is never attained in the flesh. Never. Never, ever, 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 ever. But in living by grace. Through faith. That's how it goes. It really does. But see, we need to be shaken. To realize what Jesus Christ is doing in the Sermon on the Mount, he's doing it today for us. Wake up. We all need a little wake up. You see, the fulfillment that's attainable is that I realize my righteousness stuff is never attained in the flesh, but living, in, living by grace through faith. My mom and dad raised me well. I really believe that. They did all they could. They taught me rights and wrongs, but they had a long list of do's and a long list of don'ts, and that was fine. I grew up in a religious home, but there was an absence of a relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. I was taught to go to church. I was taught to be a good religious person. I was taught to go to confessions. I was taught to pray. I was taught to do a lot of things. But again, I learned something in my own religious DNA that I could somehow earn my way to heaven. Now let's transport to being born again. Around 24 years, around 24 years old, I was born again. I started going to a Baptist church, and I heard some similar things. But they were being preached from the Word of God, but I translated them with do's, don'ts, all the Bible verses that I was hearing, all the preaching message. I'm figuring a fulfilled life is to do everything that someone else is doing, and if the church will give me a list of what I need to do, then it will supersede all of God's laws and I'll be fine. Even if they're not teaching that, that's the way I translated it. Let me give you a better example. I used this earlier. Now, some of you are really, really good husbands in here, right? All of you that are good husbands, say amen. They fell into that one, didn't they? All of you didn't say anything? You're smart. Sean, you're a good husband, right? I'd have to ask your daughter to get the truth, but I won't ask your wife. I'll save you for that. Now, here you go. You've done maybe one or two things wrong in your home, right? Maybe once or twice, maybe. Once or twice, okay. Okay. So, as all of us, as husbands, 
And you thought I was talking to you, Sean. I'll say, well, just grab both Sean's. Here we go. So here we go. So husbands say, okay, I did something wrong. What am I going to do? I'm going to fix it, right? I did wrong. I'm going to fix it. That's all I'm asked to do. Fix it, fix it, fix it. So you did the wrong thing. Now do the right thing. You did the wrong thing. Do the right thing. Now, my wife will be temporarily happy with that. Of course, Cheryl, she's always happy with me. So there's no problems at all there. So this, of course, is not an illustration for me at all. So we're just on husbands now. Watch this. You know what your wife would love for you more than anything else? Is for you to say, my righteousness is not predicated on my fleshly actions to you to make something better that I messed up. Right, Cody? Anna would love for you to live in the righteousness of God. So there's an overflow in your life. So that you say, hey, I'm living by grace through faith. And then when things mess up, forgive me. I was wrong. I am sorry. I will make it right. And I will make it good. Not going on and on and on and doing a bunch of fleshly actions. You see, people spend 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years of their marriage counterpunching, playing ping pong, bouncing things back and forth. Because it's all about attaining righteousness in my wife's eyes through my flesh. My wife does not appreciate that whatsoever. I thought I had her fooled for a long time. And she had to go get closer to Jesus. And now the home is affected by me playing righteousness in my flesh. Try that in ministry. Try that with your children. You see, attainable fulfillment, our righteousness is never attained in the flesh, but in living by grace through faith. I have a ton of verses up here. I just want to highlight something for you and bless you a little bit by God's word this morning. I know God will do the blessing. I won't. Go to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. If you can write really, really fast or say, hey, Brownie, put those notes up on the website like you promised. I will, I will, I will, I promise. I promise. For the third straight week. we got to get this up on the site so you can have all these references and there's more. But here we go. Psalm 119, famously known as God's Word speaking on God's Word. Right? Psalm 119, verse number 40. Follow along with me. Watch this. I'm just going to stay in Psalm 119. Here we go. Behold, I have longed after thy precepts. Quicken me in thy righteousness. Go to Psalm 119, verse number 123. Mine eyes fail for thy salvation and for the word of thy righteousness. Now let this kind of marinate in there. Come on, let that get in there. Verse number 142. Keep on going here. Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is the truth. Trouble and anguish have taken hold on me, yet they command, thy commandments are my delights. Verse number 144, the righteousness of thy testimonies is everlasting. Give me understanding and I shall live. This is a way to attain fulfillment in your life every day in his righteousness. Verse number 172, my tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are righteousness. And you can go on and on. Isaiah is filled. Psalms is filled with incredible amount of references. Just between those two, there's 120 references to the word righteousness. Go read them. Don't do it on me and put it on me. Well, you only read those few, and you have the ability to look things up in a concordance. Is that way too, like 1990s? Okay. You can electronically look it up. Understand that the attainable fulfillment that you can have is found by living in gra by grace through faith. These Bible verses on and on go on and on. Isaiah has so much to say, and the New Testament does as well. I put something up, of course, the, bo the book of faith and the book of grace that you can look at in Romans. Verse number four, 13 of Romans 4 says, For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed. Remember, it was also given to David and his, the, the Davidic covenant. Remember when we studied that in 2 Samuel? But what's Paul telling us? 
It was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. They still had to believe in God by faith. Yes, keep the law was part of their way of proving their faith. But they had to have faith in God. It's always been that matter. You say, well, the law had to be fulfilled. Jesus Christ came and fulfilled the law. And all those in the Old Testament understood the prophecy that came from Isaiah and the prophecy that came from all the prophets about Jesus coming, they were looking to that coming. If you're wondering, go to Hebrews chapter number 11. You see, attainable fulfillment is dependent upon Christ the King and living in his kingdom, in God's righteousness. Our righteousness is never attained in the flesh. It can never be attained in the flesh, but it's in living by grace through faith. The other side of this is the next two verses. Two pieces here. The other attainable fulfillment is found in verse number 19 and 20. It says there, whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven can you imagine speaking that to the jewish believer in the coming millennial kingdom those that by faith and are martyred and get through the tribulation period and they're there hey you know what you're going to be called the least in the kingdom of heaven if you just broke one of the least of the commandments that's pressure aren't you glad for god's grace But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Verse number 20, for I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. Remember we looked at that and what that looks like. Because that's a man thing. A man's righteousness in their own. But God's righteousness is how we know that we're righteous in Jesus Christ only. He shall no case enter into the kingdom of heaven if you can't even exceed, which is the most righteous people that are on the face of the earth at the time. Here's the other attainable fulfillment. Watch this. Watch this. It says up there on the screen for you to really just kind of digest. I hope that the Lord just shows you this. Our righteousness is not outside his kingdom but in daily living by obedience through love. Another simple, old-fashioned illustration takes a few seconds to just comprehend. Every single parent with their children wants their children to obey, but they want them to obey out of love. I love you so much, Mom and Daddy. I'll, I'll just do whatever you want me to do. But that takes a while to get there. So sometimes you gotta womp them a little bit. But that's the rod of correction. That's a biblical principle. Drives that stuff far from them. But you want them to know that you love them so much that you're teaching them that there are parameters for your behavior and there's righteousness that God desires from you. And these are the rules and regulations and these are the punishments for it. So... I want you to know that there will be some of those, but I want you to get to a point where you're just going to obey through love what I've asked you to do, not obey because you're so afraid of me doing something to take away something because you did something wrong. See, God wants you and I to live in his righteousness found in his son, and it cannot be done outside of his kingdom. It has to be done inside his kingdom, the kingdom of God. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. It's his righteousness that we're to seek. There's so much here. Let me just show you a little bit of New Testament. Go to Galatians chapter number 2 real quick. Galatians chapter number 2. Some references in Romans. You know there's Romans 3, 4, 5, 6. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 10. I mean, there's so much in there in Romans. But here I just want to show you a little bit of Galatians. Galatians chapter number 2. Many of you know this verse. Listen, it's very simple what God is teaching us through his word today. But it's also very difficult to really grasp, which is I can have a fulfilled life. I can have attainable fulfillment in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse number 21, chapter number 2 of Galatians, it says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. 
For if righteousness came by the law, then Christ is dead in vain, and we might as well just walk out the door because we're wasting our time. But we're not wasting our time because this is it. This is it. Galatians 3.21. What does that say? Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But that's not so. Because he says in verse number 22, But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. I believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I turn from the way that I was living, and I want to trust in you, God, to take my life. I need forgiveness. Please, God, forgive me because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross, and I don't have any idea what my life is going to look like, but I don't want to live the life that I was living before in sin. Now you live in the righteousness of God through the Lord Jesus Christ, and now the righteousness of Jesus Christ is imputed upon you, and it says in Galatians chapter number 5, verse number 5, for we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, which is a physical act, nor uncircumcision, the spiritual act, but faith which worketh by love. That is what he's teaching us. The word of God is teaching us. It's not some act or not having that act. It's you and I, knowing that we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior one time in our lives, and we have the righteousness of God upon us in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus wants us to know that his righteousness is really deep down inside inside of you. And that's where you're going to have complete fulfillment in him. It says in Romans 5, 17, a familiar verse, For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. That's the life you have right now. As much as you have the hope of the righteousness and the kingdom of God fulfilled in the kingdom of heaven and all that's going to come in the reign with Jesus Christ one day. But right now he's saying, you are right dead smack in the life that I want you to have in the righteousness of my son, Jesus Christ. That's complete fulfillment. How does fulfillment become attainable today? How does it come become attainable? Seek his righteousness for your life in his kingdom. Don't seek your righteousness in your kingdom. Don't seek your righteousness in his kingdom. Major conflict. Don't seek his righteousness. Just seek his righteousness in his kingdom. And you and I will attain fulfillment each and every day. What should I do with the rest of my life? Why don't you just do that today? And he'll show you what he wants you to do all the way down the road. Would you bow for a word of prayer, please, as we finish out? As you bow your heads and close your eyes, my sister's going to play some music in the background. I want to have just a a little time of prayer, reflection. If you want to come forward, you can be respectful of others now. But with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I just want to ask you a question. How does fulfillment become attainable to you personally today? What are you seeking after? What are you seeking every day as a believer in Jesus? And then maybe you're not a believer. So what are you seeking? The question's for both of us. What are you and I looking to have fulfillment in today because he said every day if you would seek first my kingdom and my righteousness no matter what evil comes he says the fishing unto the day is the evil thereof give no thought this is the truth of God's word this is Jesus preaching sermon our father we come to you by the promises of your word and the promises of what you have said through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, 
in the work on the cross and the resurrection of what Jesus has done. The wall partition was torn down. The rent, the veil, the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. There is nothing in the way in Jesus Christ for us to come to you, Father. So we come very needy. And I pray that you will just work upon your people so that we may see the fulfillment and the life that you've given us completely attainable because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ that you've imputed upon us. Thank you, God, for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your love. We extol you and we exalt you and we thank you for the preaching of your word from the Sermon on the Mount. This is not our message or mine. It is Jesus' sermon. And we thank you for what you're doing in our lives. Please have your way. In Jesus' name, and God's people said, amen. Thank you for being here this morning. I want to put something up on the screen as you're dismissing. All of you kind of know.